All right. Let me go ahead and begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, for this time together to be in your word. Um, speak the truth that you need us to hear. And um, we ask that you will watch over all uh, during these times of uncertainty and uh, give us the strength and the patience and the endurance and, um, and uh, joy through all of this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. So uh, we uh, left it off at chapter eight. I've given a bit of a tease that uh, chapter eight kind of is a continuation of the last uh, part of the seals, the seven seals. So we'll just jump right in. Uh, the first part of it's kind of a transitional um, section here. Uh, is anybody uh, up for reading uh, verses one through five of chapter eight? I will. Okay. And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayer, prayers of all saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense, which came with the prayers of the saints, ascended up before God, out of the angel's hand and the angel took the censer and filled it with fire um, of the altar and cast it onto the earth and there were voices and thunderings and lightning and an earthquake okay. um, <clears throat> so the uh, this opening of the seventh seal is basically uh, kind of a segue to the next seven um, trumpets so Kind of what's happening here in a literary way is um, they um, were moving. I mentioned before that Revelation is kind of written in an elliptical way and we can't really follow it chronologically. It doesn't follow a chronological order. But these seven trumpets are now going to be a different way of looking at what we looked at with the seven seals, which is basically the span of of creation, I mean, from creation to the end of time. Um, the uh, interesting thing, like um, I mentioned, <coughs> excuse me, one of the, it's kind of an interesting literary technique because we've had this vision in heaven in chapter seven, and now we have this image of uh, all this stuff around the, uh, the incense, the altar, the throne of God, and the angel has this stuff and throws it to the ground, to, to the earth, and we have all these peals and thunders and earthquakes, and again, it, when I hear that, when I read it, it kind of reminds me of the, of the magician who throws down that, throws down something and get this big smoke puff, and then he, she disappears, uh, um, and this is kind of an interesting literary segue that gets us focused now Okay, now we're moving out of this heavenly realm of chapter seven into, and, and it's interesting because the author's kind of pointing us back down to earth uh, with all of this, all of these uh, unusual uh, images. Uh, the images also are for the reader a reminder of the, the temple, the worship in the temple, that uh, the holy of holies. And so we're moving out of this Holy of Holies area now back to talking about things of the earth. Anything, um, any questions you have in this kind of first few uh, verses of chapter eight? I was wondering if uh, that's where they get, you know, the censer and the incense. Uh, some of the churches they use the incense and they they actually take the censer up around the altar and and all the smoke because it's uh 
I think I wonder if that's where this comes from. <coughs> Revelations. Yes. Where they, where they got that idea in the church. Yeah, absolutely. And and it's a, it's an Old Testament practice as well. The the incense was was uh, you know <coughs> around the altar. Um, and and when, when you go to like to say a Catholic worship service or an Eastern Orthodox worship worship service, um, they have this thing called a, I think it's called a turble. A turble, yeah. And and they you know kind of waft it around, and there's kind of a skill to it. You got to it's all in the wrist, yeah. right? Yeah. And um, so like even like at a Catholic funeral, they'll they'll do that around the casket, mm. and you know it's a symbolic of of the holy. Yeah, uh, symbolic of prayers going up, ascending to God, yeah. uh, which we get out of the Old Testament, the Psalms, and the the uh, the worship that took place within the temple. Mm -hmm. and so the author's reminding the readers, you know, you know, kind of those images of their past. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, Judy's uh, cough is contagious. <laughs> oh, sorry about that. <laughs> no, that's that's mm -hmm. okay. I get that every morning, I think it's. Um, I think I've coughed every day of my life. I just always have a little dry cough and it always seems to hit when I'm either in the service or on a Zoom call. <laughs> <laughs> no worries, no worries. I, uh, uh, I, could, I could tell you some, <laughs> some stories. <about laughs> Things happening at uh, times that they shouldn't have, but that's for another <laughs> day. Okay, chapter eight, verses six through the end of the chapter. We'll, we'll just take this all in one chunk. And if anybody's interested in reading, if they would read uh, six, take us through the end of chapter eight. I can do that. Thank you. Then the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to sound them. The first angel sounded his trumpet and there came hail and fire mixed with blood, and it was hurled down upon the earth. A third of the earth was burned up, a third of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. The second angel sounded his trumpet, and something like a huge mountain, all ablaze, was thrown into the sea. A third of the sea uh, turned into blood, a third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. The third angel sounded his trumpet, and a great star, blazing like a torch, fell from the sky on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star was Wormwood. A third of the waters turned bitter, and many people died from the water, the waters that had become bitter. The fourth angel sounded his trumpet, and a third of the sun was struck. A third of the moon and a third of the stars, so that a third of them turned dark. A third of the day was without light, and also a third of the night. As I walked, I heard an angel that was flying in midair call out in a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth. Because of the trumpet blast, another could be sounded by the other three angels. Okay. <clears throat> a lot of... <laughs> A lot of destruction going on here. Um, it's it's kind of unnerving um, when you read it. You know all of these catastrophes that are happening on the earth. Um, and again, just a reminder that these events have happened from the beginning uh, of time after the fall. One of the one of the things in, in the fall is that not only was um, you know, and I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Jens, I think um, the uh, Crossway series really brings this out that when, when the fall happened, there was a rift between not only God and man, humanity, and not only a, a separation between humans in their relationship, but there was a there was there's a fall that has occurred in creation itself and that things in creation aren't as they should be uh, all of these relationships were damaged uh, in the fall so um, we see creation kind of 
rebels against itself in many ways. Um, and Paul would bring this out in one of his epistles that one of the things that creation is kind of yearning for its redemption along with the rest of humanity when Christ returns. Um, it's interesting because, um, <clears throat> you know, I think, well, obviously back in the day, they didn't have, uh, you know, media coverage of all the catastrophes that happen around the world. And even, you know, when I grew up in the six seventies, um, you know, we had in the States, you know, we had ABC, NBC, CBS, we had PBS, um, but you, you only got the nightly news, you know, it was either Dan Rather, Walter Cronkite, you know, somebody like that. And you had 30 minutes, they had 30 minutes to kind of show you what was going on in the world. You know, I always remember the old Walter Cronkite and that's the way it is. <laughs> Yeah, he had quite a voice. Yeah, yeah. You very know, good. Oh, very good. And I'm sure in Canada, it was the same. You probably just had the CBC and the and CTV and, and, and you had the nightly news. Now we've got this 24-7 news cycle and you can get news any time of day and night. And you get to, we, we, we witness because of this global village more catastrophes. It's not necessarily the case that there are more catastrophes and uh, floods and fires and stuff. We just, we're just exposed to it more because of news media. And the other day, I, I have to admit, I'm kind of a weather channel junkie. That kind of goes back to my military days. We always had to know, you know, what the, what the weather was going to be like. So I always had the weather channel up and going. And I still do to this day. It's I don't know what it what it is. I, I try, <clears throat> excuse me. I try to convince Jocelyn that I do this be, out of love and consideration for my family. I want to know what the weather's going to be like. In reality, <laughs> I think it's just kind of an addiction. Uh, <laughs> but you know, well, the other day where I was watching it, and they're you know showing you know the Santa Ana winds and and fires in California. You got floods. You know clear across the world in, in Southeast Asia, you know, the tornadoes and everywhere. And she's like, really, D does this interest you? I said, well, it's, for me, it's, it's better than watching all the political mess <laughs> south of the border. <laughs> but I guess my point is that we, we because of, of the, mm -hmm. the constant, media coverage of all these things we it can kind of get a bit overwhelming um but i i think i think we're probably just we're just more exposed to those things that are happening around the world than they were back in the day uh and i just i just bring that up because all of these things that are being um poetically expressed here with these trumpets blasting are kind of symbolic of, you know, of the catastrophes that go on in the world. But the one thing that you'll see often in this section is it always says a third, a third, a third of these things were destroyed. And that's kind of a reminder to us that as bad as all of these things are, it's not total destruction. Um, you know, it, it's, it's kind of like that promise that God made, you know, that he wouldn't flood the whole earth again, that, that there's this protection over creation, even as it is kind of rebelling against itself. So that's kind of, that's kind of the hope in all of this kind of scary stuff that's, that's, that's being written here. Um, a couple other things is this whole thing about wormwood. You know, it's, it's another, it's kind of like a poison. It's bitter. Um, the name of the star it's talking about here is Wormwood. And we're going to be introduced a little later in this chapter. Um, Cause Wormwood um, uh, and a falling star, it, the old Testament refers to Satan or Lucifer as a fallen star or a fallen angel. Um and so we're going to talk, it's, it's kind of the big theme of chapter eight is that all of this garbage in the world 
all of this mess can be traced back to this personification of evil, this, uh, as the scripture calls, Lucifer, Satan. Um, unfortunately, we as humans are willing accomplices sometimes in uh, the negative um, events of this world. Um, anyway, uh, anything that stuck up to you in these uh, in this uh, section here in these first four trumpets being blown. I was curious about the third of everything, but I guess you've explained that. Mm. Well, one thing I forgot to mention is that you'll, you'll hear some things that are familiar in here. Uh, one of the things that the author does is he talks uh, as they're under the empire of Rome. He's kind of, hearkening back to Egypt, the blood in of the water, the, um, the all these different catastrophes, the, the, the um, what else does it talk about? The, the kind of the, the hail storms of the fire that came on the earth. A number of these things that are being written here would take the reader back to the 10 plagues that happened in Egypt prior to the Passover. And it's kind of a reminder that as they're under a certain empire, God's people of the past were under an empire and they were delivered. They were delivered. Um, so it, it offers a bit of hope with that metaphor. You mentioned uh, there also Paul in Romans 13. Hmm. There, how yeah. then? How shall we live? Or was it the chapter eight, where the restoration of the of the cosmos, or no of creation? Apostle Paul asked a similar. He asked a similar question there. John, John seems to suggest that he believed the time was soon for these events to take place. As Revelation often does, it invites the reader to examine their life and ask the question, how then should we live? And Apostle Paul question in Romans 13. There, yeah. there his, his answer is basically, lay low, pay your taxes, Love one another. And love one another, knowing that the time is near. John and Paul were speaking to us today, and they are through the text. They might say, keep going to church, pray, rejoice, and live a life of love, and sing, remember the walls of Jericho. <laughs> yeah. Um, I was yeah. just reading that from your write-up. Right, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, a lot of these, uh, you know, Kind of like the overarching themes uh, of Revelation include God is large and in charge. You know, no matter what we see in the world, God's still in control. And and all of these things, these events that occur around us, these catastrophes that we see, are to challenge us to remind us that we are finite beings. Uh, we have a limited time on this earth and. And, and, and call us all to repent. And it's, you know, repentance for me, again, I don't, I used to think of it as a scary word, but to me, it's more of a, it's a reminder why I'm here, that, you know, to not, to not live my days out simply for myself, but to know that I'm here for, we're all here for a purpose. And, and these, events that happen around us are to remind us that our purpose is to love God and love people. Um, it's, it's interesting because uh, I think it was in the 90s, 1990s, I think Rick Warren came out with his book called The Purpose Driven Life. Mm -hmm. And that really took off like gangbusters. And, and that makes sense because I think what was happening and what is continuing to happen in our society 
and in, in each generation. The question, when these uh, tragedies happen, the question is always why? And what's our, how do we fit into all this? What's our purpose? And so it takes us back to the scriptures to say our purpose, love God and love others. And, um, you know, realize that time is, time is short, you know, um, as I, as I go down this road a little bit longer, pushing 56 and I don't know, I, I guess this is a, a formal announcement that, uh, will be a grandfather in June. Um, Hmm. just discovered so pretty excited about that hmm. um and and you know you know when, when we when we go to a funeral you know the funeral isn't necessarily for the person that has passed it's it's right. for all of us exactly. as a reminder yeah and um and and to make the most of, of the time that's been given to us but sadly so there's a generation out there now that don't really believe in funerals and they have this thing called a celebration of life somewhere and they have a party. So I don't find you get like at a funeral, you really do have a feeling of that sense. The funeral is for me. Mm -hmm. I am the, the one who is still here, yeah. but you don't find that in the celebration of life when they do not include God in their celebration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. Uh, yeah, and you know, because it's this time of season, um, one, of, one of the classic books, you know, uh, of literature is A Christmas Carol. And there's a great movie out about how that came into being. Um, uh, it came out, I think, last year or the year before. I don't know if it was on Netflix or <laughs> Or one of those, but it's it's about what Dick Dickens went through to do that, and and the people that were in his life that influenced him, and how he was really kind of in a in a literary lull, and so he wrote this little. It was kind of a short story, and um, it it um, well the rest is history. But one of the things I I've often thought of, and there's. There's some of uh, Jesus' parables about, um, like the the, the <clears throat> of the the man who acquired all these things, and then his life was required of him, and he went, uh, he died, and saw Lazarus, the the guy who was always at his uh, gate, and he was so poor, the dogs were licking his wounds and all that, and and. And you, and you look at the book in the, of Revelation, how it's written, it kind of reminds me of the tale of A Christmas Carol. Mm. In the sense that, you know, good old uh, um, Ebenezer Scrooge has, has his, his uh, partner Marley come back as a ghost and, and tells him all these things about, you know, what he wished he had done. And the chains that he had because he he was selfish and so he's visited by these three angels or three ghosts uh christmas past present and future mm -hmm. same kind of genre that revelation you know you have these images and they're part of the part of the the, the idea is that okay now what do i do how do i how do i live in this world and so that's always the challenge uh, uh, that the, the text presents before us. Um, okay. Um, everybody excited about the Christmas star that's going to be occurring in the next week or so? Yes. You've heard that on, on the winter solstice that Jupiter and Saturn are going to be aligned. Oh, it's it gonna, went exact. I, I saw something about it, but there was no uh, time. Yeah, it's actually going to fall on the longest day of the year, which is interesting. Longest night, uh, winter solstice, the 21st. 21st. Yeah. Wow. Hope yeah. we can see it. Wow. Yeah. So, and uh, so this hasn't happened in like 800 years. The, the thought is scholars have thought that the, the, the Bethlehem star was actually an alignment of 
this one's Jupiter and Saturn, but they think the other, the Christmas one uh, on Jesus' birth um, was Jupiter and Venus that, that created that star that the, that the wise men went to go see Jesus. And this is kind of a little sidebar. The wise men didn't go see Jesus for quite some time after Christmas. You know, right. we kind of we kind of squeeze them all in. in the Christmas story. Yeah, a few days later. Yeah. Yeah, but in, in reality, it could have been up to as long as a year before the wise men came. Um. So, um, anyways, that's just a little sidebar. Epiphany, and I'm already I've already got my head spinning with thoughts for Epiphany uh, themes. Uh, Epiphany is often called the the Christmas to the Gentiles. Mm. All right. Mm. Now that I've got all the trivia stuff out of the way, let's go on to <laughs> chapter nine. Unless there's anything else you wanted to delve into here, but. Uh, we can go on to chapter nine if uh, it's okay. I'll go ahead and read the first. Um, well, I'll go ahead and read most of this and then we'll kind of um, pick it apart. One of the things, this is kind of the section of Revelation that got me interested when I was a young seminarian and I was working at a group home and I had this, I think she was a Jehovah Witness girl but she had some real she had some issues with bipolar and things of that nature and she was scared to death of this section because she thought it was um, a reference to um, tanks and helicopters and military equipment and she was half right and i'll explain that when we get to it so anyways here we go chapter nine and the fifth angel blew his trumpet and i saw a star that had fallen from heaven to earth and he was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. He opened the shaft of the bottomless pit and from the shaft rose smoke like the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened with the smoke from that shaft. Then from the smoke came locusts on the earth and they were given authority like the authority of scorpions of, scorpions of the earth. They were told not to damage the grass of the earth or any green growth or any tree but only those people who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. They were allowed to torture them for five months, but not to kill them. And their torture was like the torture of a scorpion when it stings someone. And in those days, people will seek death, but will not find it. They will long to die, but death will flee from them. In appearance, the locusts were like horses equipped for battle. On their heads were what looked like crowns of gold. Their faces were like human faces, their hair like women's hair, and their teeth like lion's teeth. They had scales like iron breastplates, and the noise of their wings was like the noise of many chariots with horses rushing into battle. They had tails like scorpions with stingers, and in their tails is their power to harm people for five months. They have as king over them the angel of the bottomless pit. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek he is called Apollyon. Apollyon. Okay, I'll stop right there. Um, or weird. Yeah. <laughs> weird. <laughs> so we have this image of this bottomless pit. Uh, there's uh, this angel. This that's somehow connected to this bottomless pit. The broad view is this, the, the 10,000 foot view here is that the author is saying all of this garbage can be traced back to the evil one, to this fallen star, this fallen angel. And of course he's talking here about battles and wars and we have these interesting images of like scorpions but and notice that it says it says that uh, they're not uh, da, 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 da. they're allowed to torture the people who have the seal of God on their forehead, but not to kill them. Mm. Um, mm. This is kind of a interesting imagery, mm. and and I think when we unwrap it, it'll, it'll make sense. Um, 
believers in history certainly have been killed in war. And we also know that many, of, many people in this time were killed as martyrs, mm. persecuted for the faith. Yeah. This whole idea of not being harmed, uh, they're being tortured but not harmed, I think is a poetic way in which the author says, we might have physical pain, we, we might get hurt and injured, we even might die. But as Paul would say, going back to Romans chapter 8, nothing in this world will separate us from God, uh, not even death itself. So even if we die, we are in a true sense, in an eternal sense, we're not, we're not dead. We, it's, it's, we're injured, we might get hurt, we might feel pain and all that, but um, this is kind of a, a poetic and literary way of saying that um, mm -hmm. this evil one, while he does uh, inflict damage on the world and on, on us as individuals, um, he can't destroy us. Um, it's, it's kind of like Luther's anthem in a mighty fortress, though they take our goods, fame, child, and life, yeah. and kingdom ours remains. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's kind of what this whole section is. Yeah. Insane. Um, so these, uh, the interesting, the locusts that look like horses equipped for battle. Uh, interesting thing that, that their heads, they had a crown of gold. And you can think of like the Roman soldier's helmet. And mm -hmm. it had that little tuft that looked like a, the female hair that it's talking about here. Mm -hmm. You've got the breastplate. You know, uh, this scorpion tail, you know, they, they, they had a spear. So, like I said, this, this, this girl who was having nightmares about this, thinking that these were, uh, uh, they were talking about, you know, um, helicopters and tanks. Like I said, she's half right. Uh, I think what the author is doing here, John is doing here, is he's describing in a very poetic way the military of that day, the Roman soldiers. And you can imagine the sound that they would make as he talks about the sound of these locusts, which is kind of a derogatory term for the, for the military. They, if they came through your town, you know, a thousand of them, think of a legion coming through your town, the sound of their feet on the ground would have been very powerful and very noisy. And it would have commanded a lot of fear, which was the intent <laughs> when they would come strolling in town. It mentioned five months. Five months, yes. Again, another limited time. Uh, it, it just kind of shows the limit of the power of the empire, the limit of the power of the evil one. Um, where God's power is infinite. So it's, that's, yeah, that was a good catch there. These, uh, these different names at the end, uh, the name of, of this evil one called Abaddon and Apollyon. Abaddon is a Hebrew word. Um, I gotta go back to my notes here. What did I say? It is the... Um, mm -hmm. That's my place here. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's the, uh, it means destruction. And then Apollyon is the Greek word, which means uh, destroyer. <laughs> so uh, this Apollyon was the Greek god of war. So this section, like the previous section, talked about all these catastrophes, earthly disasters. This one now is talking about the human uh, catastrophes that are brought about by war. And again, remember this, this isn't all chronological, you know, it doesn't, it's, it's all kind of this elliptical imagery that you, we can't follow, like, it's not catastrophes happen and then war, they're all kind of mixed and mingled together. Um, last night we got into a discussion about evil. 
And um, well, hmm. yeah, so it's probably as good a time as any. One of the things that we don't often talk about these days, it's not in our societal lexicon, is, is the un understanding of evil in the world. It's a, um, you know, one of the things that we're seeing through this book of Revelation is that, that there is evil. Um, and, you know, there's, I guess you could say levels or degrees of evil, but evil is, is, is very prevalent in the world. Um, sometimes it, it, uh, is embodied in a, in a structure, in an organization, in an institution. Um, sometimes it's, can be centered in a person. Um, I think of, you know, earlier in this year, uh, Jocelyn's friend, Lisa McCullough, Collie, who was, um, she was actually going to come out and visit us this summer, but she was one of the, she was the teacher that was shot and killed by the mass murderer in Nova Scotia. Uh, he was a neighbor, lived a couple houses down from her. And when the neighbor started setting houses on fire, she got, she went out to try to rescue her neighbors and, and the guy shot her. Um, and you, you just kind of go, this doesn't make sense. You know, and, and for a lot of us, we, we want to see the good in people. Um, but uh, I'm sure each of us have been in one way or another touched by, by evil in the world. Um, and um, yeah, so it's, um, I don't know if I don't want to, I don't know if I should say that we kind of sanitize evil or we we you know we try to reason it away in some ways but it but it is a it is a reality and sometimes you know as I, I said last night I said you know sometimes when, when when bad things happen to us you know if you can say bad is kind of a generic term for evil we we can kind of work through that and kind of say, you know, after the fact, it might be hard to go through it or, or somebody really bad, you know, wronged us. But usually afterwards it, it strengthens us or what like that. Yeah. What I have a hard time with is looking back in my life and the times when I was not the best for others, when I was bad, when I, put my will ahead of somebody else's or I, you know, uh, participated in, in things that I shouldn't have and, and hurt people or, or said hurtful things to people. That's hard for me to, to, to digest. Um, it, um, and I guess when those things happen, they do remind us that, you know, we need a savior. But um, anyways, uh, I, just, I just wanted to kind of, you know, I don't often do sermons about evil and, you know, oftentimes one of the things I, I joking, have jokingly said is you don't want to find the devil in every doorknob. And um, sometimes, sometimes people are just doorknobs. <laughs> They're not not necessarily evil and you don't want to you know put that label on people but there's certainly there's certainly when we you know when when i've counseled a lot of people that have come back from war and they've seen evil <laughs> um and i guess in in the gig that i'm in i've i've encountered from time to time, you know, like um, things that were just weird. Um, I guess, I don't know if I've told the story th before uh, to this group about 
when I was in North Carolina and um, I was in the, I was serving in the, uh, the Marine Corps there and I, I was just sitting in my office one day and a couple came in and uh, the guy was a Marine. I think they both were Marines. Anyways, they came in and they told me the story. The, 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 the wife had grown up and she said by a, by a, I don't know, she, she grew up and she'd have this image, this aberration that would kind of come into her room, a dark coat and a dark hat and just, it had kind of tortured her most of her adult life. Mm. And, and the, the husband never saw this and he, he thought she was, you know, kind of a taco short of a combination platter. And, uh, <laughs> And uh, until he saw the image, the vision too. And that's what got them into the house, it got them to my office. <laughs> so they said, have you ever done a house blessing or an exorcism? Mm. It's like, oh, no, I haven't, but I'm, I, I'm willing to. So the next day I went to their house. This is North Carolina, it's Southern, Southern state, middle of summer, it had to be like almost a hundred degrees outside, crazy humidity. I walk into the into their house, and I was like, "Man," I said, "It's chilly in here. You know, you got the you get the air on." And they said, "No, we have the heater on full blast." Hmm. Okay. I'm dealing with an entity here that uh, I have not encountered before. <laughs> oh, really? And so we did a house blessing, went through and anointed just about anything I could. Um, and it, it worked. <laughs> they, they were, uh, whatever it was, had left. But it, I mean, you could sense something there that was ominous. Um, so what it was, I don't know, but, um, anyway, <laughs> from a movie. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <clears throat> Exorcist or something. And, you know, it's not just, I mean, yes, the, I, I, there's a, there's a reality out there that we can't see. Uh, again, I don't. It's, it's not to, and, and the other thing is that, you know, those things, what, what is the most dangerous is when we don't acknowledge that there's such things. Evil. When, uh, or, um, you know, I think the evil one, uh, th that's kind of like flashy stuff, but when, when, when the evil one is active under the scenes and we don't, you know, we kind of make them out to be a guy with a pitchfork, and uh, then then that's that's probably more dangerous than all these other goofy Ouija board nonsense stuff. You know, but there, you know, you, I I I tell confirmands, I've told them my whole uh, ministry. You know, you can't mess around with that stuff. Uh, there is a uh, there's you know in that spiritual realm. Um, it's not all good. And you just gotta, you gotta be very discerning and not, again, not to be, get too overwhelmed by it or not to, you know, see the devil behind every door, but, um, but just to realize that, you know, and we don't talk a lot about that these days. Why? That's a Why? good question. Well, I, I, I think, I think, um, uh, how do I how do I say this? Well, I think many people think that that's from a time gone past. That that these are kind of fairy tales, and and um, now that we're a little more enlightened by science and things of that nature, um, you know, there's no such things as angels and demons. And okay, well. <laughs> Uh, so we don't, yeah, we don't talk about them. I've had uh, as, as many of those haunting stories, I've had 10 times more of 
people who have had angelic um, visions and images in their life. That I, I probably did tell you. Just Don't you think that, uh, you know, in the church, um, you know, with the presence of God, and it would be more angels than demons, you know, but I, I'm not saying that demons does not come into the church. Mm. I think I have witnessed that, uh, you know, and, um, uh, there was also some, there is something there about uh, there was, when Jesus was in the synagogue, there was uh, uh, evil spirits there. So, so they can certainly come into the church, you know, and, but I think the, it's, it's more prevalent that God's presence is there and that that's its angels. Yeah. And, 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 and don't you think that's why we don't talk so much about it? You know, if we're faced with, with the uh, evil and, and with the, um, uh, you know, witnessing this, uh, you know, and feeling it, then uh, we probably would talk more about it. I remember, you know, like uh, this goes back a few years ago, but we had this um, African man. He came into our Bible study between services. His name was Nathaniel, and um, uh, he he uh, he knew his Bible really well, and and he participated. Uh, and uh, very very interesting uh, uh, man. And he came to our church probably for a year and a half or something like this, and then he moved to a different area of the city, and and so we didn't see him anymore. But uh, he grew up in in Africa, and and he talked a lot about demons. Yeah. And, so, so I, I think there is a, it's very prevalent uh, in, in, in other countries than it is here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. South America, maybe too. Yeah. And I, I think we don't, we, like, we often don't in Western culture uh, personify the evil. Like, we don't label it as a person. We just kind of label it as, you know, um, we, we might say an organization's evil because they promote this or that, you know, racism or whatever. Um, but we don't kind of personify it, maybe like it's more in, in Eastern cultures. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, I, I remember coming out of seminary thinking I, I knew everything and I, you know, that the angels really didn't, you know, appear to people. You know, I, I, my, I, one of the things it was, it was interesting. I had a, uh, I had a, a member of a congregation um, when I was in a denomination that I won't mention uh, prior to coming to the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. Uh, let's just say its, it's initials are LCMS. <laughs> but anyways, I, I came out of that, uh, it was, I was probably my second or third year uh, as a pastor, and I, I, one of my members was going to uh, seminary, and he said, can you give me, you know, one bit of advice that I can take with me to seminary, and I said, don't lose Jesus in your academic activities. Right, yeah, exactly, yeah. If we, sometimes we can get too smart mm. by halves, and, and we kind of lose you know, we lose that childlike faith uh, mm -hmm. when we try to over-rationalize God. <laughs> um, God works in mysterious ways in some ways we, that we don't, we can't fully comprehend. Um, you know, I, you know, I think my wife, you know, having a miraculous cure from a stroke that doctors said that she should have died from, um, uh, and yet, you know, I see people that have the, have the same kind of stroke and they did pass away. Hmm. I don't, we don't have the answers <laughs> to, to everything, um, you know, from the, from that strange encounter in North Carolina that I had to a friend of mine that got in a car accident and three people were in the car and, the, and, a, and a witness said, where's the fourth person? And it, hmm. Yeah, that, mm -hmm. that, that was protecting all of them. So, I, you know, it's, um, it's that whole, you know, his ways are not our ways. 
and they're above and beyond us. And they, it is also that out of evil, good comes. Yes. yes. Uh, incredible stories have been said mm -hmm. because of what happened to me. This is who I am today, or they've grown in immensely mm -hmm. through the evil that took place. Absolutely. Well, good point. I mean, it, it, you think of all those things in our lives that, you know, strengthen us. Nine times out of 10, it were, it were those difficult, hard, bad, evil things that happened in our life that where we had to kind of simply rely on God. And you're absolutely right. God can take that's and that's really the other big theme in Revelation and really I think of all the scripture is that God can take this evil and and make something good out of it. So that incident that happened with Jocelyn's girlfriend, that whole whole scene, not just her girlfriend, but that whole scene, how it affected the people in that area heck of a lot more than us out here in Western Canada because we are so distant from that evil that took place. It hit us, but locally, we, we have no idea how that evil to this day has influenced all those people in that area. Yeah. Uh, some, some good had to come out of that. We don't know what it is, but yeah, yeah, it's horrific, horrific. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And 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 also, Can you imagine the children dealing the children dealing with that. Yeah. Making yeah, she, sense. Of it. Yeah, mm -hmm. I know. Yeah, she had two children who now live with uh, uh, Lisa's sister, and um, or no, not Lisa. Uh, with Lisa's. Um, sister-in-law um yeah because she and i mean just like her her brother died a few years ago from cancer and she's shot and killed and so she has two kids that are now with the, the sister-in-law and it's just uh, mm. it's yeah i that's you know that is that is our hope that's our faith you know that says mm. something good is going to come out of this mm. It is that Romans, all things work together for the good. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that's the whole message of Christmas. It's the, it's the message of the cross. You know, out of this great tragedy, mm -hmm. salvation comes to the earth. Um, and so um, that's, our, that's kind of our that we cling to and hold on to when, when, you know, we see catastrophes and evils perpetuated in our life. Um, yeah. So, you know, it, 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 I, I get it, you know, going through this book of revelation is, is hard because I think a lot of people do shy away from it because it's, it's, when you kind of scrape away all of the the allegory and the and the metaphor and all that, it's it it just kind of it kind of hits us between the eyes of the realities of life, um, and um, it's a lot easier to just kind of brush those aside, you know, and you know our wish is like, can't everything just be rainbows and puppy dogs and unicorns <laughs> and sometimes life isn't always like that but what's neat and we're going to see it is there's going to come an angel that has a rainbow over him <laughs> so there's which is it what, what you see through this is you're going to see the symbolism of the evil isn't infinite uh it's there's limits to it um but we're also going to see at the very end, everything comes out really well. Mm. It comes out well. 
Um, this kind of remi uh, reminds me of one of the things I just wanted to kind of wrap up with. One of the things that we'll see in Revelation is, uh, especially at the very end, you know, uh, I've often said that, that the scriptures do not really get to tell us what heaven is like, except often in the negative. And what, what I mean by that is that it tells us what heaven will not be. There won't be death. There won't be sorrow. You know, there won't be. You know, no more tears. No more tears. No more tears, exactly. All of these things, it's not going to be, but oftentimes it doesn't reveal to us what it will be like, except through metaphor, streets of gold, things of that nature. But one of the ways I think we can understand what heaven is like and what the new heaven and new earth will be like is by going back to what was what was like the what was original creation like. And see, that's what the author is going to do at the end of Re Revelation. He's going to take us back to the tree of life for the healing of the nations. And, it's, it's, it, and you're going to see a lot of these images of, of the Garden of Eden um, prior to the fall. <clears throat> so if we kind of look at all of this stuff that we're looking at in chapter 8 and 9, we're looking at the world after the fall and all the mess and the destruction. And I love the image of this uh, bottomless pit, you know, all this garbage comes out of it. It reminds me of uh, when I open up my compost trash bin in the middle of summer and, and you get that waft of whew, garbage. That's kind of the image here. But if we go back to this idea of the garden, one of the things that I've always found interesting and since the garden talks about angels blocking the, the, the Adam and Eve get banished out of the garden, right? And they have these cherubim with swords keeping them out of the garden and keeping them away from the tree of life. And I've always thought, man, that's a that's a punishment, isn't it? Until, until you think about it in this way. They had fallen. They were destined for a life, I don't want to say of misery, but it wasn't paradise. Paradise had been lost. So God banishes them from this garden and the access to the tree of life. And it says in, in Genesis that he does that so that they would not take from the tree of life and live forever. Now, like I said, I've always thought that as a punishment, but it's actually a blessing. God, now that they're, we're in, they're in this fallen state, God did not want them to live in the fallen state forever. He did not want them to live in this, as Luther called, a veil of tears, this pain and suffering forever. So they didn't get access to eternal life in, in their fallenness. But the rest of the scriptures point us to Christ, who would make all things new again. So one of the things that we see and that the, the author has done is we're always trying to understand what our future will be like by looking back at the past. What has God done for his people in the past? How has he he's rescued them, he's delivered them, and he will do the same in the future. Um, so I don't, ha, has anybody ever been to a Passover meal? Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 So uh, one of the things that's interesting in the Passover meal is when they start talking about the plagues and, and being delivered, uh, in the Exodus. And mm -hmm. if you, if, if you ever, if you remember what, it, what happens is that they don't talk about it in the third person. They don't say when, when they were enslaved but they talk in the first person they say when we were enslaved in egypt when we were this and when we were that the passover meal is a remembrance meal but it also connects the future with the past and you can think of that with the lord's supper too it connects us to the remember. yeah and so yeah. we're always 
it's it's always a future present past that and we kind of see that in revelation to understand the future we just look back to the past and what god has done for his people it's funny because today i have a friend he turned 75 so i send him those balloons on text you know those balloons yes and i sat there and thought well what am i going to tell him at 70 75 years old today and then i thought you know i have known him for 50 of those years. And then I talked to him about the blessings that he, he's had 75 years of blessings. Mm -hmm. And then I went into like his beautiful children and his grandchildren and his daughter-in-laws and son-in-law. But uh, And then I said, all the joy that's come to him in 75 years, he's been blessed. Going back 75 years. And I said, and I was a part of that for 50 of his years. <laughs> it just, that happened just very at eight o'clock this morning. I sent him the text. <laughs> yes, that's cool. Yeah. And, and you know. Bless him, yeah. With all so, the things and all the tragedies, mm -hmm. life is good. You know, yeah. it's, it's, it's a gift. It's a blessing. Um, and and the the joy of you know christmas the joy of easter the joy of resurrection is knowing that you know there is more to life than this and and we have that waiting for us but we also we also can kind of start living it a little bit right now even in this fallen state we and we do that as we as we live a life of uh of love toward others and and uh and um, yeah, so not to be all down and negative, Debbie Downer. Um, it just made me think of at this time and the, the, the people losing their jobs and the deaths and everything. I really think so much has come from this. I mean, the connections people are picking up again and um I heard on the news this morning that a lot of people are actually financially doing okay because they're not going to restaurants or going to the casinos or whatever, you know? So it's a horrible time. It's a sad time. People are struggling, but there's, there's still good coming out of this. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Lots of good. Lots yeah. of good. Yeah. And we keep, and it's the, and, and that's a good thing. And that's a real, that's a real ministry, uh, and it's it's mm. to to share with people, you know, to see that there is good coming out of this, and, and there will continue to be good, even on the other side. I mean, there's good right now in the present, for sure, and so uh, yeah, and that's that's you know that's kind of, I think that's the call on, on us as the church, is to keep yeah. kind of reminding people of that. Uh -huh. and, and then, you know, living into that. Absolutely. Well, thanks, everybody. Um, and I hope you all stay safe. I know we're going to be going locked down here in a couple of days. But uh, the, uh, it's such a blessing that we have this opportunity to get together. Um, uh -huh. One of the things I was going to say is that next week on the 17th, let's uh, plan to make that our last study for 2020. Okay. And, and then we'll we'll restart it again in January the seventh. Um, we'll have an opportunity to kiss twenty twenty goodbye. Yeah. Give it a swift kick in the keister out, and <laughs> <laughs> here comes twenty twenty one. Right. We'll always we'll always remember twenty twenty. <laughs> And our grandchildren, oh my gosh. Oh, yes. When they grow up, they'll all remember 2020. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And we'll have to keep all the terms. <laughs> we'll have to keep a few masks as reminders. <laughs> I, saw, so I, saw so yeah. I saw somebody who did, uh, did one of these disposable masks and they, they, set up, they, they um, tied it up in such a way that it looks like an angel. Oh, okay. Oh, really? Cool. So maybe put a few of those on the tree. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> elastics for the years. Yeah. Great. 
Well, everybody, have a great day. Great week. Yeah. God bless you. Everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you. Take care. Okay. Bye. Now. That was very good. Thank you. Thank you.